Chapter 21 1550 hours 198.776 M41 Fifth compartment, sparsed bonds, auction 60s. For a whole day, they held them off. About three hours after Rune's unilateral repulse of the Blood Pact, the enemy struck again from the east, using the quartz bastion from the Ridge 19 to shield its approach onto the compartment floor. Then, following consultation with Debray, Wilder had brought the entire bulk of the 81st first into position on the eastern flank, in anticipation of just such an event. Leaving the Colstec 40th to assume responsibility for the Hill 56. At that point, the day seemed to turn spectacularly bad, massed in much more considerable numbers than before. The blood pack poured out into the scrub, was only determined not to be denied a second time. The 81st first became locked in place, rigidly defending a two-kilometer line of rough ground from hasty dugouts, relying heavily on its crew-served weapons. In apparent coordination with the Blood Pack's attempt at the eastern breakthrough, the arch-enemy armor brigades beyond Hill 56 renewed their assault. All possibility of the fatigued Rothberg tankers withdrawing evaporated. With the Heberkin reserves, they became tangled in an increasingly feral struggle, which was only relieved by the arrival of the promised Saproy armor, the force that had been supposed to replace them on the field. More Kolstek infantry was rapidly set down from Post 36 to reinforce both Hill 56 and Wilder's line. The strings of Valkyries began flying urgent munition runs back and forth across the southern compartment to keep both fighting zones supplied. By nightfall it became evident that the arch enemy was not going to back down from either fight. Through the course of that long, wearisome day, Wilder had kept himself updated with news from the Mons as a whole. From the sound of things, the third compartment was in even worse state. Both Wilder and Foboris had sent requests to High Command, via Debray, for reinforcements, but got little satisfaction. Significant reserves had been sent through to the third compartment, where the situation was described as grave. After a while, even that choked off, Wilder listened to frantic and disheartening vox traffic, describing mayhem in the first, second compartments, where relief columns were becoming boxed in by personnel fleeing the third compartment. Fights. There were also ominous reports that some of the relief forces themselves had broken back. Too scared of what they had heard was happening ahead of them. Some of these units were actually reported to be in flight. Others, more cautious perhaps, were declaring mechanical problems and other setbacks that were preventing them from moving. It was an ugly picture. The two key hot compartments, 3 and 5, were enduring massive offensives, and the rest of the Imperial strength was milling about in headless confusion, unable or unwilling to come to the aid of the either. It had been Wilder's professional experience that warfare ebbed and flowed. Quiet days, quiet months, could suddenly be disturbed by angry flares of enemy activity. He did not see anything especially sinister in the fact that the enemy had chosen that particular day to coordinate and unify its defense of sparse mons. In many ways, he'd been waiting for it to happen. But there was no denying how successful the arch enemy had been. No one knew for sure how centralized the enemy command was in the mysterious heart of the mons. But by weather means, it had orchestrated a shatteringly well-timed attack on all sides. And the system and discipline of the vaulted Imperial Guard had seized up, paralyzed as a result. In the fifth compartment, fighting continued after nightfall, as the temperature dropped and the ferocious battle tank behind Hill 56 raged on, lighting up the low horizon and painting the looming black walls of the compartment with the shadow play of colored flashes. At Wilder's line, the intensity dropped a little, 
but all through the night the support weapons of the 81st First continued to hammer away at the invasive attempts by the Blood Pack strike teams to edge their way forward in the darkness. Just after midnight, one force almost broke through, but it was denied by Kyle's company after a brutal 40-minute gun battle across the foresty scrub. Other dangers lurked in the darkness. Stalkers appeared again, some inexplicably hunting the darkness behind the Imperial front, as if they had somehow lurked hidden during daylight in dens or lairs in the southern part of the compartment. Two munition convoys were attacked, and men lost, and for Boris, Kolstek troops were on the hill, surfaced a series of predatory raids from the rear. The next day dawned, but the sun was only a little bruise of light against the black undercast. An unnaturally dark smoke rising off the third compartment, war zone, was blackening the entirety of Sparsh Mons. The surreal twilight it created seemed like a product of some foul sorcery. Along the 81st first position, things were quiet for the first few chilly hours of the day. Fox distortion levels rose, and the expectable daylight winds groaned across the scrub in clumpily thorn rush. Then the blood pack renewed its assault on the eastern flank. This time they sent stumble guns to shatter the infantry line that had repelled them time and time again the previous day. While they had been forewarned about these things via the garbled reports flowing out of the third compartment, they're supposed to strike down everything before them like skittles, random and wild, and make a path for the ground forces. There were three of them. They came down across the apartment ridge, 19, rattling like pebbles in a mass can. At the distance, they seemed too odd, so unthreatening. While those troops had just stared at them, steel balls trundling and across the the damp, gritty soil. Then their spines started to grow, and they began to flash out, serrating plasma beams in all directions, like jumping firecrackers. The men and women of the 81st First, veterans all, did not break in panic, as the experienced binders had done the day before in the third compartment. They held their line. That resolve cost them nearly thirty lives in the time it took to kill the stumble guns. The worst of the losses were amongst L Company, Varin's group. Oblivious to the stupendous rally of gunfire they sent at it, the stumble gun rolled onto them and crushed those that, that it did not dismember, and char with its beams. Corporal Chorus, one of Varin's toughest, finally halted its progress. Luck, more than anything else, had left Chorus unscathed as the ball weapon rolled past and he bulled a grenade in through its armored structure, annihilating the operator. Course did not live to celebrate, as it expired. One of the stumble gun's final specific plasma beams vaporized his head. Commissar Hawk had led an attack on the second weapon, determined to stop it before it reached the 81st first position. Despite the loss of their four the troopers, Bold enough to go with him into the reach of the lethal device. Hawk blasted a shot after shot into it with his plasma pistol and managed to kill the operator. Directionless, the stumble gun rocketed to a halt, smoking. Krafen, Kahin, and Belladon Gersper, each of them armed with thread feathers and supported by anxious teams of loaders, used up fourteen rockets between them, stopping the third. When the last two rockets managed to penetrate the heavily armored sphere deeply enough to touch off its plasma vats or cause some kind of critical weapon failure. The stumble gun exploded like a miniature star. Gahin and Jesper argued imminently over which of them should claim the kill. The 81st first line rippled with mingled cheers at the sight of the last stumble gun's demise, but the reef was short lived. With stock tanks and modified cannon platforms to the fore, the Blood Pack's main assault came in. Three hours of intense fighting followed. More than once, Wilder was afraid they would be overrun and slaughtered. 
but Hark and Novrosky, along with the company leaders, kept the position firm. Even Roan Wilder noted, with a mix of satisfaction and annoyance led from the front, spurring the guardsmen on. Just before noon, a phalanx of Herbergen treads, part of the reserve element from post-36, arrived in support. The formidable range of an effort, effect of their main weapons crippled the coordinates of the blood pack front and forced it into a retreat. Wilder was amazed. He never thought he'd be glad to see Herbergen tank. After the battle, an uneasy lull settled, keeping a careful eye on the ridge. The 81st First took advantage of the quiet spell to eat rations, service weapons, and even fetch a few quick minutes of sleep. Though it was long past the middle of the afternoon, conditions had not improved. The day was still lightless and dismal, the air bitter cold and the ground hard as lead. Wrapped in camo cloaks and bedrolls, troopers huddled down beside boulders or nestled into patches of stiff grass. Some just sat looking out across the scrubland, where hundreds of corpses and the wrecks of fighting machines lay scattered, all the way back to the jagged quartz of Ridge 19. The Herberkin treads had taken up position on the left flank of the 81st first position, and while they went to liaise with the crews, leaving Basquille to supervise munition distribution from a prior of Valkyries that had just arrived from post-36. I think we should go now, while it's still quiet, McCall said. If we leave it much later, it'll be dark. Rowe nodded. They'd found a place to talk away from the others, behind some broken lime trees about thirty meters away from the E Company slit trenches. Crid, Vau, Foiger, and Larkin were with them. All right, everyone gather what you need and meet up out beyond those rocks in fifteen minutes. Brown said, We oui. Val suddenly made a brusque, throat cutting gesture with his finger, and Round shut up. Gorgola and Bandur were approaching. Everything all right? Gorgola asked. Fine, said Brown. Just uh, taking a breather, Val said. Gorgola glanced at Dur. See, they're just taking a breather. I told you there was nothing dodgy going on. You're right, said Doe, leaning against the trunk of a lime and folded his arms. And you say they look... conspiratorial? Gorla said to Doe. I did. I did say that. Gorla looked at Rome. There's nothing conspiratorial going on here, is there? Ron said nothing. Gorla looked at McCall instead. Is there, chief? Just a bunch of comrades taking a breather, hanging out. I shouldn't read anything in the fact that... All you lost souls who went to Grion? McCall held Kola's gaze, without any sign of discomfort. There's nothing going on, Kola, he said. Kola pursed his lips and looked up at the sky for a moment, as if watching the black clouds chase. I got roasted a little bit, he said at length. For siding with you yesterday, Roan, Waldo was pretty gacking pissed. We pulled C and E out of the line without his say-so. Even though it turned out we had a good reason, I don't blame him either. If I was Wilder, I'd be mad as hell. This is a good unit, and most of it is down to his hard work pulling it together. Noted, said Roan. Why are you telling me this? Because I'd hate to see that happen again, Kola replied. It's a great thing all of you made it back to us, but if you refuse to settle, it's going to cause problems. If you're chasing secret agendas, for instance, it'll be divisive. How will Wilder maintain authority if you constantly refuse to work with him? The 81st First will suffer, and everything and everyone that used to be the 10th First will suffer too. I understand that, Ron said. But there are just some things. Like what? asked Dower. Ron inhaled deeply before replying. Some things that won't fit into your nice ordered boxes. Gut instincts, feelings. I don't like this man, Welder. 
and I honestly have no intent to damage that unit. But there are just some things. Are they important? Dower asked. Feth, I think they are. Ron replied. So bring Wilder in. Get him on your side, instead of sneaking about behind his back, pissing him off and undermining his command. Wilder won't... How do you know that Wilder will or won't do? Oh? Gola asked. Have you asked him? Have you given him a chance? Ben's right. Wilder's a good man. And when us ghosts thought you and McCall gaunt and the rest were all dead and gone, we got ourselves lucky to get him as a commander. I say you go talk to him. Ron looked at the others. None of them made any comment. Grion really messed you up, didn't it? Kula said softly. I think you all got so self-reliant, forgotten how to trust anyone. You don't know what it was like, Forger growled. No, I don't. You bastards still won't tell me. But I think I just hit a nerve, didn't I? You've forgotten how to trust. We trust each other, Ron said. And we trust Gaunt. Is this about Gaunt? Dara asked. Perhaps, Ron said. So where do you loyalties lie? Gola demanded. To this regiment or to Gaunt? Because if the answer is Gaunt, this isn't ever going to work. Do you remember his last command? Grid asked. They all looked at her. The wind gusted and lifted her long hair away from her face. And they all saw the ugly scar across her left cheek. The blade wound she'd grown her hair to hide. His last command to the tenth first, she repeated. Before we left for Grion, Gaunt told the ghost that if he didn't come back, they were to serve whoever came in his place as loyally as they had served him. We should tell Wilder, Ron, as soldiers of the Imperium, we're obliged to, because that's what Gaunt ordered us to do. Good news, Basquil said to Wilder and Novbrowski. We just got signal from 36. We should expect some serious reinforcement by dawn tomorrow. Von Voigt has committed the entire Flag Flats reserve to the front line. Everything, Wilder said. The fool works, Basquil confirmed. I guess he's getting as tired of this place as we are. Don't look now, Novbrowski said. Ron, McCall, and Golo were walking across the scrub towards them. Great, said Wilder. Don't go far, either of you. I seen friendlier looking mutants. He took a few steps forward. Golan McCall fell back a little so that Ron came up to face to face with Wilder. Major? Colonel, I think it's a good case to be made for us starting over. Really? Wilder raised an eyebrow. The situation is difficult, and the return to this regiment of the Grion mission team, particularly myself and Sergeant McCall, must have unsettled loyalties. You could say that. My actions yesterday can't have helped much. Brought a smile to Wilder's face. All right, Ron. I don't think I'm not appreciating you making this effort, but I get the feeling there's something more to it. You'd be right. There's something that has to be done. I was just going to go ahead and do it, but Major Kola took the trouble to remind me that I am an officer of the Imperial Guard and have responsibility to clear things with my commander. Bonus points for Major Kola, Wilder said. All right, shoot. What is this thing? It'll be dark soon, Ron said. After last night's experience, we should form a secure reward perimeter to prevent any stalker trouble. Agreed, absolutely. See, that wasn't so hard, was it, Ron? Wilder said. He paused and saw the look on Kola's face. There's more, isn't there? Kola nodded. Sir, Ron said. I'd like to take advantage of the current lull, not only to set up a perimeter, but to also tracking these stalkers. Tracking them. McCall's pretty sure he can do it. 
Tracking them, Walder repeated. To find out where they're coming from, McCall said. You mean dens or layers or whatever? Or whatever, McCall agreed. Why? Walder asked. That's the part you're not going to like, Kohler said. We've not had that already then, asked Walder. I received a message from Gaunt, Round said. Walder took a casual step backwards and looked sidelong at Novobrosky and Basquil. You know that feeling? He asked them. When you find out your girl's still writing letters to an ex-lover, Basquil snickered. Walder looked back at Roan. Roan. Roan, I couldn't feel much more undetermined, undermined, if you, you get a hold of a frickin' landmine and put me under it. That probably sounded better in your head, didn't it? Round said. Yes, said Walder. Really? Much, much better. <clears throat> Listen to me, Walder, Rune said. There's everyone including High Command, the Commissariat, the Inquisition, and our old comrades in the Tenth First, has been quick to point out. The team that went to Grian came back different. You don't spend that long on a chaos-held world and not have it affect you. <clears throat> it changed the way we fight. It changed the way we live and think and the way we trust. All those changes are alterations forced on us by simple need to survive. Grion left a, its mark on us. Like a taint, Novobrosky asked. He was only half-joking. Yes, said Ron. But not the kind you mean, just to stay alive. We developed a hunch, an instinct. Uh, what would you call it, McCall? A sensitivity, McCall said. Yes, a sensitivity. A little inkling that range alarm bells... That ring alarm bells when things aren't right, when the ruinous powers were playing tricks or about to strike. I got that inkling now. So gaunt, we had it since we first set foot in this place. What does that mean? Wilder asked. We don't think sparse mons is what it seems to be. It's not just an old ruin with the arch enemy hiding inside it. Something else is going on. Think about the stalkers. Where, where in the name of Feth do they keep coming from at night? I don't know. No one does. Gaunt suggested it was high time someone did. He contacted me because he thought it was a job idly suited to the Tenth Scouts, to McCall and Bonin especially. If they can't track these things to their source, no one can. And what does he expect you'll find? Asked Basquil. Let's hope layers and dens, McCall said. Burrows, maybe. Natural hiding places that no one has yet detected. But your inkling tells you, Walter began, that they're getting in a different way, that this place isn't what it seems. If that's true, said Novbrowski, it could change everything. All right, you convinced me, Walter said. I'm not happy, but you've convinced me. Assemble a team, Roan. Not just Grion survivors, though. Include Novbrowski, at the least a couple of Belladon scouts. Yes, sir. And keep checking in with me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir! Roan saluted and walked away. Walder turned to Beskil and Novbrowski. That was right, wasn't it? He asked. Beskil nodded. If there's even a shred of truth, Novbrowski said. This is important. And if there's not, at least it gets Roan out of my face for a few hours. Walter grinned. Who knows? You might get lucky. Something might eat Roan. The hunting party left 81st first position half an hour later and headed south into the board scrub at the compartment center. Roan had brought McCall and Bonin, Val, Creed, and Belton and left the choice of Belladons to Commissar Nubrowski. Nubrowski selected Fyrdi Kurslim, Vis Mags, 
and two recon troopers Ron hadn't met called Cornitas and Villard. They moved south in wide circle through thickets of gorse and thorn rush and across fields of loose flint and ashy soil. Three times in the first hour, McCall announced he detected a trail. Each one was at least two or three days old, in his opinion, and too vague to bother with. I don't see anything. Mags complained each time. Why am I not surprised? muttered Bonin. McCall led them through a belt of dead trees, leafless dissected coasters, bleached by the elements, clawing at the sky with gnarled branches. Massive boulders slumped between the trees every few dozen meters, mossy blocks of misshapen granite that looked as if they might have tumbled down from the compartment walls generations before. Nicole and Bonin studied each one. What's the interest in the rocks? Dobrowski asked Rune. Don't tell me he tracked the stalker in the third compartment. The trail seemed to go dead at the foot of a large rock. He tracked one, the Kamza queried. Actually, the tracking was done by Ezra Knight, a greyon pierced in who kind of attracted himself to Gaunt. Attached himself to Gaunt. Excellent tracker, mind you. Quite brilliant. If this night fellow is so good, said Novraski, why has Gaunt got us doing this? Gaunt wants to support his theory with clean evidence, Brown said. You are high command, Novraski. Who would you trust? The Hethian claims of a primitive hunter or the authentical findings of an Imperial Guard recon expedition? Point, said Novraski. Here's something, Cole called. They hurried over, Crid Val in the Belladon's former perimeter. It's getting dark, Val called out, up and raised. I know, replied Roan. Cole was crouching beside the foot of a large rock. Trail, here, Cole said. Pretty fresh, too. It seems to go right under this rock. How can that be? Cole Slim asked. Mags bent down beside McCall. I see it this time, Throne. McCall, your eyes are good. No doubt about it. It runs right in under this rock. Here's another, Bonin called. Main group moved across to where his knee was kneeling. In an open patch of rush grass, the troopers on watch moved with them, rifle steady. Really getting dark now, Ball called. I know, said Roan. Just saying, said Val. Fresh, living that way, Bonin said, examining the trail. Maybe last night, this morning early, Cole nodded. This way. Hang on, Cole said Cole Slim. Said Cole Slim. His voice had an amusing lisp to it because of the swelling around his slight lip. I thought Bonin said it was moving that way. I did said Bonin. So why are we going in the opposite direction? Because we don't want to know where it went, Theody. Mag said, We want to know where it came from. Say what you like about Mags, Bonin said to McCall. The quick learner. He is, McCall agreed. He really is. Crid suddenly held up her hand. Party froze. From not too far away, a whooping war rang through the dead frost. Oh, tremendously not good at all, said Varl. Full auto, Brown said. Safety's off. Never mind that, Dabrowski said. He drew a pistol from under his coat. Heavy, matte black and ugly. It was unmistakably a plasma pistol. Hark lent me this. Hark lent me this. Thought we could do with the extra oomph. I've always loved Kamazar Hawk, Val said. Belton grinned. Crid sighed. Something moving. Thirty meters. The call nodded, signed the party to move on anyway. Crid and Val brought up the rear, walking backwards, rifles aimed into the gathering dark. 
trail led into another clearing. At the center lay yet another big rock. A three-ton ovid. A three-ton ovid, gleaming with varnish of glossy green lichen. Stay back, said McCall. The party halted at the edge of the clearing. What is it? asked Novrosky. Feel that? McCall asked. Bodden built and nodded. Sure, fifth do, Rand said. It's faint, but it's there. Tiny buzzing. Like a glyph, said Bilton. Exactly, said Rome. Exactly like the sound of glyph makes. Um, what's a glyph? asked Quintos. You don't want to know, said Bonin. Damn, it's making my skin crawl, Rome. Making my tongue itch, said Varl. I can't feel anything, said Nobrowski. Except the sense of unease. Is that just me? Run shook his head. Not the first time I heard this in Oxion Sextis, Cole said. Heard it last time, Max. You too, Major Colslim. Buzzing, Colson replied. That was deafening. This is much more low level, but it's the same thing, Bonin said. Ah, oh, shit, said Villard. Look! Belladon's scout was pointing towards the boulder and the clearing. Something wrong was happening to it. It was distorting, bending and twisting, as if they were seeing it through a ripple of a heat haze. The buzzing increased in intensity until all of them could hear it. There was a noise like cloth tearing and a sudden pop of pressure change, like an air gate opening. The lifeless trees around them shivered in the insulation of the cold wind. The boulder was no longer there, occupying its presence, space, and shape was a doorway, a gate, a simple impossible hole in the fabric of the world. The hole shimmered, mist, frost white, slowly drifted out of its dark, yawning gulf. Reality had somehow folded up on itself to allow this hole to be. There's God's answer, Bonin said. I don't understand what I'm seeing. Brusky muttered. What you're seeing is a very bad thing, Commissar, whispered McCall. I hate to correct you, Chief, Rob began. The stalker Trice Rout, 800 kilos, emerged in the hole as if it was sliding out of the surface of a mirror. It prowled forward in its knuckles, shoulders hunched and rolling loose. It sniffed the air. Yeah, said Varl. See, now... It's a very bad thing. Alright, that's going to do it for another one of these videos. Hopefully you enjoyed it. That one was... A lot of talking. A lot of back and forth for characters. I'm not used to that, but I like it. Yeah. I think the Gots Ghost series would be really good type of uh, movie or TV show series, kind of like for HBO did for Band of Brothers. It'd be very appropriate, honestly. <clears throat> Anyways, that's, um, that's my own personal thing I would love to see done for a TV show, but I don't think it ever will. <sighs> so sad. Anyways, let us go on with the ongoing Patreon support members of the channel, starting with the new and improved list that I will be updating. Again and again, the more people add or subtract to the uh, the uh, listing. <clears throat> Starting with Cesar E. Lopez, Jamie Davidson, Ricky Brown, Mattis, Josh Sickles, Azuth89, Thompson, 239, Starboard, Lilac, NPC, Ken S., Mike Hunt, Fortis Unam, Eldrick Maldred. I'm not saying that name. Uh, Keller's Z94 <clears throat> and Cocoa. Nice little protogen profile. Love it. <laughs> Anyways, thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. And hopefully, we'll be seeing more of you guys join the Discord or, uh, 
Patreon team just to say hello. And, um, yeah, all you guys that are on the Patreon, let me know what you want to see read next on the last, uh, update I posted on to the Patreon. <laughs> last post I made. Yeah. What book from the library that I have shown? Uh, what would you like for me to read next? Would you like me to continue something that I haven't read in a while, or... Yeah, whatever. Let me know. I'll get working on it. Anyways, up next is Kyphus Kane, The Greater Good. Take care of yourselves out there. I'll be seeing you, and... Hopefully you liked the video. Goodbye. That is completely not what I normally say, and... It hurt to my brain a little bit trying to figure out, oh, what am I supposed to be saying here? What do I do? What am I saying? Whatever. It, it, it is what it is. Take care of yourselves out there. Have yourselves a good one. Goodbye.